Okay, well, how do you, what does it look like? How do you transcribe? What, what do you do when you're transcribing? Well, things you need to think about as you transcribe are the names of respondents. And it's useful to just use a standard format for entering the names. I've suggested some of them here. You can put a person's actual name and perhaps, you know, an initial letter for their surname, so it might be Mary Clark, so it comes as Mary C on your transcript. And then it's consistent. Every time Mary talks, you have the same letters in front of her speech. For the interviewer, you might have I for interviewer, I, V, or int, whatever, I mean, you know, all sorts of ways of doing it. Put your name on if you like, you know, G for Graham, uh, and so on. Um, but do be consistent, so that for one interviewer, you use the same name all the time on the transcript, and the same for the interviewee, sorry, interviewer, I mean. Um, it depends how you want it formatted. You'll see some examples that I've got um, later on in the, the, the module. Um, people do it with the, the name and then perhaps a colon and then indented text, fully indented text. Um, in other cases, some people put the name of the speaker on another line, so that there'll be a character turn and then the next line the speech starts. Um, now, which you use might depend on what software you're using, and there are different standards for different kinds of software. So you need to think about that. And I'll talk more about that when I, when I look at the software. Um, but again, read the manuals that come with the software. But there is no single best way of doing it. One program wants it done one way, one program another way. And you know, some programs do it either way you like it, so it doesn't matter. But think carefully about how you're going to do it. And make sure you do it right from the first time. The reason we're using capital letters, by the way, is because you can do a search on the computer, either on the word processor or in the software, for the person's name. If you do it in capitals, you'll find, of course, that occurrence. But if you find somebody else's speech talking about Mary, if you search for capital M, lowercase a-r-y, then you won't find Mary's name appearing here. You'll only find it when Mary's being talked about. So it's a useful way of, 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 of you know, controlling the search. And it also helps it when, when you see it visually, you can see what it looks like. Right, well, I said Mary C is the name, but you should um, anonymise things. Um, and as far as possible, make sure that if anything you know, is published from your research, the names should be anonymised, so that the, you know, the names of the people and contextual names, like the organisations they work for, the towns they work in and so on, all of those are anonymised. But you will need to keep the original names yourself. Now, my normal practice, actually, is to keep the names on the transcripts as I analyse them. So I have the original data with the original names on it. But when it's published, then it gets anonymised at that stage. On the other hand, you might decide it's better to anonymise it right from the start. The trouble with that is you lose the contact in your mind between, you know, it wasn't Mary C, you anonymised Mary to, you know, Respondent 2 or uh, June or something like that. So you have to remember June was actually Mary or Respondent 2 was Mary makes it slightly harder for you to think about what you're doing and what you can remember of the interview. So that's why I prefer to keep it unanonymised until the last minute, which you will need to do that eventually. Um, and if you archive it as well, you need to think about that. So published only anonymised versions. What else for pairing the text? Um, you need to check it for accuracy. I've said that about 300 times now. Check it for accuracy. What if you can't hear things? Uh, then use a standard thing like this angle, the square bracket, three dots, square bracket, to indicate something missing. Something was said, but none of us can work out the, tr the type is kind, I can't, we can't work out what was said, just can't remember it, so it's missing. Um, other possibilities, um, bribery question mark. Did the person actually say bribery? I'm not really sure. So put it in square brackets with a question mark, uh, just to indicate that you're not quite sure about what, what was being said. And also print it with wide margins, because you're going to be writing on things. And you'll find that when I give you some exercises later on in this module, I'll try and do things with big margins so you can write in them. The idea is that when you start to code and work with this material, you do write on it a lot. So double spacing, or spacing and a half between the lines, and wide margins to write in on the side of the page are really helpful, because it then gives you space to put in those notes that you want to. You don't always have to use them all the time. But you know, some bits will be very detailed and have lots of lines, lots of comments on them and so on. So leave space for that. Structure of the, 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 the transcript. This is, well, two things really. 
here. One is to do with the software, and a lot of these things affect the software, so it depends what software you're using. But some of it is simply to do with consistency. So if you've got a structured questionnaire where everybody gets asked the same questions, then make sure you use something like Q1, Q2, and the question perhaps, and always use exactly the same wording on everyone's transcript. So you can always you know, be consistent about how you find things and how you search for things. I put here that if you're doing it in Vivo and you put those question headings in a heading style, do you know about styles in Word? Anyone, anyone not know about styles in Word? Okay, so you know what heading one is then? Yeah, okay. So, NVivo uses the same styles as Word. So if you put it in heading one star, when you enter the data into NVivo, this is a software package, you can automatically code those headings as codes in the program. So actually, as you enter the data, it'll do some coding for you, some rough and ready coding on the program. So that's a usefulness of doing it that way. Um, section formats is another issue, particularly if you're um, doing it in NVivo or other, or, or Air Practice TI for that matter, um, it allows some use of automatic coding. Again, I did it, a data that I've been working on for the past year. Um, we formatted it so that there were two cash returns between the speeches. So there was, the speech was always a lawyer asking a question and a witness replying. So we had two cash returns, then the lawyer asking the question, then a single cash return, then the respondent, re sorry, not the respondent, the, the witness replying and then two cash returns. We did that because, again, in Atlas TI, the software we were using, it could automatically assign each of those speak, those you know, interchanges as, a, um, as a, um, a paragraph. Yeah, so again, it needs reading the computer manuals to check you know, what's going on and, and, and how, you can, um, um, how you can set things up for, for what you need. And the same is true of paragraphs too. Again, in Vivo is the issue here. If you set up paragraphs in a certain way, then you can automatically code uh, certain things as you enter the data into in Vivo. Okay, now here's, I mentioned this earlier on, levels of transcription. Um, the problem here is that people don't speak in whole sentences. They repeat themselves, they hesitate, they stutter, they talk on very long sentences. There are no full stops in, in speech. Um, they use contractions like don't, cause, I'm, and so on. And they use filler words as they hesitate, like no, and I mean, and er, and mm, and so on, all sorts of different sounds. The question is, do you transcribe all those things that people do? Do you spend the time with all these issues, repetitions, hesitations, and so on? Now, for some purposes, you do do that. Um, and I'll show you an example of this later on. It's on the handout. Um, that um, if you look at, there we are, on page three, there's a set of transcription conventions. I've taken this from uh, David Silverman's book of how you can transcribe a lot of these kinds of things, these hesitations and, and so on, attractions, etc. Um, and you need this if you're doing conversation analysis. So if you're doing conversation analysis, then this is the kind of detail you need to transcribe. Also, I've just noticed on page four are some examples of what I've just been talking about, using the different heading styles to, to, to format in, 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 in vivo in different kinds of ways, and uh, using standard questions, etc. at the bottom of the page. So, some examples there of what they've just talked about on that slide. So, the question is do we want, how much of this do we want to do? How much of this do we want to capture? Um, and I think there are four options to the different ways of transcribing. What I call just the gist, the verbatim approach, the verbatim dialect, and finally the discourse or the combination analysis, the CA level, which I've just talked about. Let me show you some examples of that. Here's a just the gist transcription. This was actually from a PhD, PhD student about 15 years ago who was working in looking at communications in small companies in, in the region. And she was only interested in communications issues. And what she did was transcribing lots of dots. These are things left out. People didn't say something here, but it wasn't relevant. So she just transcribed the relevant bits of what they were saying. So, um, so maybe somebody's name was in here. Or maybe you know, some insult, you know, that git next door kind of thing uh, was in there. But it wasn't relevant to what she did, so she left it out, put three dots in. 
that it makes the transcription much simpler. But of course, you lose a lot. You lose some of the speech. It's not there. Quick and dirty way of doing it, but can work if, if your focus is, is quite good. Now, that probably is best in things like um, uh, policy research and evaluation research and things, where you've got fairly um, simple kind of questions you're trying to answer about the content. More common is the <coughs> we call the verbatim approach, where you try and get down every word that was said, roughly speaking, in the way they said it. So you do use contractions like there, um, and so on, I don't, I'm not, and so on. But on the other hand, you do make it sentences, so you do put in full stops and capital letters and things like that. So you, you put in the punctuation that's often missing from the speech. So it reads fairly easily, and that's, that's one advantage of this method, is you end up with a text you can read quite easily and quickly. So when you're coming to analyse it and code it, you've got good text to work with. But you do lose something there, even. And what you might lose is a dialect. And here's another PhD student of mine from, again, about 10 years ago. She was interviewing um, lots of local homeless women about uh, their experience. And what she was trying to catch here was the, the Yorkshire accent. Now, I, I can't even claim to do a Yorkshire accent, so I won't even try to read it out to you. But you have to imagine as you read it, it's being said by someone who's definitely from Yorkshire, with a very strong Yorkshire accent. We talked a long time, she and I, about um, whether this should be transcribed like this or not. In the end, she got utterly fed up with it. So I warned you, if you're going to do this approach, you'll be driven mad by it. It takes an awful long time to do it and uh, get it right. And um, in the end, I'm not sure it was worthwhile. Um, I think she could have got enough from the verbatim approach without going to this extent. But it did capture something about the, the, the sense and feel of the interview, at least. Here's the most complex one. Um, this is not one I did, I got this out of uh, uh, a book, a Silverman book, I think. Um, this is a famous interview with uh, Bashir. Is it, what's it, is it Simon Bashir or the Magdalene? Martin. Um, Martin Bashir? Martin Bashir. Um, interviewing Princess Diana, obviously before she died, a long time ago. And um, this is using the transcription approach that I've given you in the handout. So if you look on page three, you'll see the use of these brackets with a full stop in um, and um, the uh, underlining parenthesis and so on, which appear here. <coughs> underlining in the bottom of the emphasis, um, that's a pause in, in seconds. Um, here's an activity, they didn't actually say that, they did it, um, and so on. And if you try to go to read that through, you can get some idea about how Princess Diane, if you, if you remember Princess Diane's speech, it actually does capture it quite well. You can actually imagine her kind of head sunk down at one angle like that, looking up at her eyes you know, and saying to him what, what she did. <coughs> and this, if you're going to use a conversation analysis approach, you do need this kind of level of, of, um, of transcription of the data. But for most of us, this is not relevant. Even if you're doing discourse analysis, this is not relevant. Uh, the verbatim approach is usually good enough. Okay, as you transcribe interviews, it's useful to have with them information about the interview itself or about the case, if there are several interviews, perhaps. So it's common to have a document header sheet um, with the, the, the data. Again, if you're doing it in the software, then you can keep it in a central place, like in Vivo, the document properties, and it's a place where you keep this information. Typical of the things you'd have here are pseudonyms, if you, if you anonymise the interview, then on this cover sheet, or document header sheet, keep the pseudonym. You can separate it out from the interview if you, if you want to. And other sorts of information you want about it, like when it was, the topic and circumstances, you know, um, interview with um, you know, so-and-so, um, she had her son with her at the time, and he cried in the middle, and so on and so forth. It gives you an idea about what happened and what interruptions there might have been. The name of the interviewer, if there's more than one of you, if you're obviously it's just you, it doesn't matter, it's all we do. But if we're in a team of people, it might be useful to know who interviews the person. Source of filled notes, if you're taking filled notes as well, and I certainly would advise that if you're doing interviews, to take filled notes as well as recording the interview. So you take notes about important things that you think about, or things that happen, or ideas that occur to you as you interview people. So again, link it to that. Other leaked documents, and that if you're doing more than one interview, that's the obvious thing to link it with, is the other interviews with that same person, same case. 
um, the source of document, if that's relevant, um, and then any additional ideas for analysis. So at this stage, capture any ideas you've got for analysis that come back into you. Write it down before you forget it and put it on the sheet. It will be transferred somewhere else later on. So there's a fairly common thing, and it used to be called the cover sheet because it was on the, you know, the, a, a transcript of interviews with a pile of paper, and the top sheet on the top was the one that had this information, so hence the term cover sheet. Um, but session summary, document header, it's the same thing. Now I mentioned archiving uh, before, I didn't say anything about it though. This is growing in popularity, no that's not the right word for it. Growing in occurrence, it's happening more often. Um, I wouldn't say it's popular though, it's certainly unpopular with me. I've just been through it, I had an ESRC grant some years ago. And one of the conditions of getting funded by ESRC, at least not, not, I think it applies to PhD work, but, but non-PhD work, is that you have to archive your data um, if they want it. And blow me, they wanted it. So we had to go through the process of archiving it. And we had two sets of data. We had a questionnaire and a whole lot of um, questionnaire survey data from that. And we had a whole lot of interviews we'd done. And they, had, they were obviously transcribed for our project, but we had to archive those as well. So we had to keep lots of information about it. We needed well, we need to get written consent, we have the consent forms, and we did the interview, so we had that at least. Um, we didn't ask copyright permission, so we didn't do that. Um, well, at least we did it for research purposes, but not for any other purpose. Um, <clears throat> and um, we certainly anonymised them, and that, that took a lot of time to go through and do that. We didn't do it immediately, we did it later. Um, and obviously there's lots of other data you require as well. So, it, it can be quite a traumatic process to make sure it's in the right format to send off to the data archive because they require it. This is where it is, University of Essex, uh, Quality Data, Quality Data Archive Resource Centre. I think that still works at URL, I hope it does. Um, but if you, if you don't find it, do a Google search for Quality Data and you'll find it. It's actually quite an interesting place because they've got data sets there you can download and, and work on. In fact, one or two of the examples I'll be looking at this, this semester are um, examples from quality data. Um, I've, 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 I've borrowed their data sets. And they've got some others, one or two on there, they're trying to show coded versions of data sets as well. And they're working on that on other project to produce that. So archiving is definitely an issue. You need to be very careful with your data, careful with the records you keep and so on, if archiving is a possibility, either because you want to do it or because you're required to do it. 